All right, I think they're rolling in. So welcome, everyone. As Joe mentioned, we're going to be doing rapid fire referral. This is a grand rounds. Uh, we have the pleasure tonight for our synchronous virtual course to have Dr. Walt Whitley. Walt, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Yep, thank you. So we have uh, myself and Joe will be uh, the moderators and hosts, and we have Vanessa here as OEC's uh, webinar administrator. Joe, you want to take care of these next few slides for us? Sure. Uh, this goes to some of the COPE regulations during the pandemic. Uh, we had to do a lot of online education, and COPE saw that good education was being delivered outside the classroom, outside the lecture hall. And we've all gotten better at giving the education and taking it. So COPE has acknowledged as good education has been being delivered online. So they came up with some new uh, formats, the synchronous and asynchronous. Now, the most important thing, anybody who takes any of these courses, please be aware of what your state society allows in terms of, of online education for relicensure. Some states are very draconian. Some states are very liberal. So it's up to everybody taking whether or not to know what their state allows. Uh, Greg, next slide, please. Now, these are the new COPE formats. There's synchronous and asynchronous. There's synchronous in person. These were formerly the live meetings where we all be in the same lecture hall together. Synchronous virtual. This was formerly interactive distance learning. These are the live uh, real-time webinars like we're doing this evening. And asynchronous was formerly known as enduring distance learning, where, of course, was recorded, and the learner can take the course at her or his convenience, but had to take an exam afterwards. Next one, Greg, please. So what does it all mean in Optometric Education Consultant? Synchronous in-person are live events. National, Pittsburgh, uh, Scottsdale, Sarasota, which is this weekend. Uh, Orlando, Pittsburgh, Mackinac Island, Quebec City, Barcelona, Spain. Synchronous virtual, these webinars exactly as we're giving them. And asynchronous were the enduring courses. We have a number of courses and we're going to update them on our website. You can take it at your convenience. However, you have to take an exam afterwards, but everybody has passed the exam. So there's no worries there. So in other words, we're here in the new COPE era. We'll, we'll always be aware of what the COPE regulations are. So we can provide you good clinical education and the ability to obtain credits to renew your license. And with that, I think I'm done, Greg. Perfect. Great job as always. And again, Joe mentioned synchronous virtual course, housekeeping. This course is being recorded. We do have a YouTube channel, Optometric Education Consultants. Previous uh, courses are there. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Uh, the event email, which happened about 15 minutes before, has the link uh, download uh, to the handout. It's a link. Uh, also, the post-event email, which is immediately after the event ends, right at 10 o'clock tonight, uh, you'll have the required post-event survey and the link to the, uh, to the course handout. Uh, also, what has changed with our new format is that 30 minutes after the webinar, via email from events at optometricedu.com, you'll get your certificate of attendance. You don't have to wait that one to two days like we did before. Uh, if you're having problems hearing us, things are lagging. Remember, everything's going after that sacred bandwidth at your house, doorbells, wash machines, iPads, and TVs, and everything's going and puts a stress on it. And so maybe if you're lagging, just have someone back off some of the bandwidth at the house. Vanessa takes care of our webinars. She takes care of a lot of things. She's one of our conference administrators. She takes care of CE broker for Florida, Texas, and South Carolina. Uh, if you are from Florida, I think you know that it won't count, but Texas and South Carolina will when it comes to synchronous virtual. Uh, COPE will get this uploaded fairly quickly, but it still takes two to three weeks. But what we like pointing out that if we don't have your numbers, whether it's a Arbo number or the OE tracker number or the CE broker number, we can't upload it. So please make sure you let Vanessa know if you don't think that you've given that. Here you're looking at probably us right about here where it says mitigating medical mishaps. But over here is what you want to pay attention to. Joe and I will police this chat. When we do polls and you hear us launch a poll, you might have to click on this button here to, to see the poll and to be able to 
to uh, to answer it. Right down here where it says course notes, that's where you're able to get the, the handout and download it. And 10 minutes before the end of this webinar, this link will become active. Well, it's active now, but there's nothing there. Uh, 10 minutes before the link for the for the uh, survey, the post-event survey is there, but it will also be in the email that comes immediately at 10 o'clock. Again, this is our team. Uh, we have Vanessa as our webinar administrator. So anything webinar, please email Vanessa at Vanessa at optometricedu.com. But we also have as conference administrators, Helen Smolinski and Marie Trusky. And then you have Joe and I, you can get again all to all of us by Greg, Joseph, Helen, Maureen, or Vanessa at uh, Optometric EDU. Um, if you want to just send it to the general uh, uh, events at Optometric EDU, someone will get to that. All right. So we're going to do a test polling question. Joe, do you have them up or do you want me to do it? Well, I don't have it up. I can do it if you want or do you, if you have access to it. Let's see. I'll, I'll open them up. Questions are open. So the question I have tonight is for Walt. I have visited Virginia. Yes, no, just driven through, or I am looking forward to daylight savings time. Yes or, or no. You forgot that one. What's that? Virginia's for lovers. Yep, Virginia is for lovers. <laughs> it's a great state motto. All right, looks like things are rolling in pretty nicely here. We don't have to get to high numbers on this, so to keep the program going, I'll just going to display the first one here. Walt, just so you know, 68% uh, have visited Virginia. 23% or 10, 11 responses have not. And we have four that have just driven through. All right, so I'm going to close that one. And we have, which I thought, 90%, 89% looking forward to daylight savings time. So I'm going to close these questions. Uh, going to close the question, close the display. And with that said, Walt, I'm going to stop sharing. You can share and give it a little pause. Welcome, everybody, to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday Night Edition. Our topic is Rapid Fire Referral Grand Rounds, and our speaker is Dr. Walt Whitley. He serves as Director of Professional Relations and Education at Virginia Eye Consultants in Norfolk, Virginia, and Regional Medical Director for Eye Care Partners Limited. His practice encompasses ocular surface disease, glaucoma, surgical call management, and clinical research. He's a nationally recognized author and lecturer, has given over 1,500 presentations on ocular disease and optometric co-management. He serves as co-chief medical ed editor for Modern Optometry, contributing ed editor for Review of Optometry, and co-medical editor for Dry Eye Coach. He's a past chair of the American Academy of Optometry, anterior segment section, and past president of the Virginia, Virginia Optometric Association, where he's been recognized as a 2012 Young Optometrist of the Year, the 2015 Legislative Key Person of the Year, and 2020 Optometrist of the Year. It's really our great pleasure to host Walt Whitley. He's a great thought leader, speaker, clinician, and educator. I think it's everybody's great benefit to have the opportunity to hear from him. So with that, Walt. Please take over and uh, take it away. Hey, well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you there, Greg and Joe and the rest of the OEC team uh, for having me. Uh, for those of you that haven't been to Virginia, you're more than welcome to come anytime. And if you saw me playing on my phone, I was trying to decrease the bandwidth from my three boys playing Fortnite. So, uh, so hopefully this should work out pretty well. My wife is policing that uh, as we speak. Uh, but great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I've learned so much over the years from both Greg and Joe. And so I, I thank you for the opportunity for, for presenting here today. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about rapid fire referral grand rounds. And so my practice 
It's a tertiary referral care practice. So we have a four cornea specialist. We have three glaucoma. We have, uh, well, it was two, now uh, uh, one oculoplastics. Uh, we have uh, a couple retina, and I oversee the optometric team, and we have about eight ODs on the team. Uh, two of them are our OD residents, and uh, then several interns. And you know, teaching is something that uh, that is one of my passions. I learned from these two as well, and they definitely test us uh, because they ask all the different questions and they keep us sharp and on, on our game. And so, um, so a lot of things that I, I'm going to present are things that have been referred to our practice. And so I work with many different uh, many different companies here. And uh, one thing I do appreciate about this is it allows me to understand, you know, what you know what these companies are doing, helping to understand or help them understand the optometry's role, but then also uh, share information, cutting edge information whenever we're giving these type of programs. And as you saw, all my financial uh, uh, relationships have been mitigated here. And so as, a, as an OD within, within a referral practice, and, and Greg and Joe both know this, is oftentimes we're seeing all the emergencies, all the urgencies, doing a lot of pre and post-operative care. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of surgical stuff. We're gonna do some urgent care. We're gonna do a lot of everything here. And that's why it's called rapid fire. And I have my two panelists that I can call on because I'm sure they're gonna call on me as I go through these, these uh, cases. And so it is only Tuesday, and so this case may not show up until Friday, Friday at five o'clock, where we're going to see this patient. And none of us want to see this patient. And so the patient, um, you know, red, painful eye, discharge coming out, and you know, comes in, comes into the clinic uh, because of decreased vision and pain. And so whether it's our clinic, whether it's your clinic, this is something that we all have to be prepared for, and know how to, you know, how to, what's the differential here? What are the treatments? Are we going to treat this? Do we have a phone a friend? Is there someone, do we have uh, one of our colleagues that can culture this for us? Uh, is this someone that, you know, we may, if you feel comfortable treating it, great. If you don't feel comfortable treating it, that's what collaborative care is all about. Uh, but it's important for us to understand, you know, when should we start initiating treatment? When should we not? And so anytime you see something like this or any type of ugly ulcer, uh, oftentimes we know that there's many causes, whether it's trauma, whether it's contact lenses, whether it's uh, uh, due to, to preservatives and, and uh, whatever, whatever can cause the insult to the epithelium and allow an opportunity for microorganisms to get into the ocular surface. So we know this is a, is a, a corneal ulcer likely bacterial, likely a contact lens wearer, which we know is the most common cause. And we know whenever we have a patient that, that presents with a corneal ulcer, contact lens wearer, we're thinking pseudomonas. And so we need to decide, is this something, let's say it's smaller, it's something that we're gonna treat. We typically are gonna treat this empirically, loading dose, one drop of a fluoroquinolone every 15 minutes for the first couple hours, and then every hour throughout the night. And patients go, really? Throughout the night? And we say, yes, really throughout the night. And we may give them mastitracin or some type of ointment to at least provide some coverage because we know it's not that easy to get up every hour to, to put this in. And so if it's smaller, this is something we'll typically treat. But if this is something that we're seeing this large, this is where we need to take a step back. And we may not want to do treatment at this time. And what I mean by that is we have to remember the rules of one, two, three. If we have a corneal ulcer within the one millimeter of the central visual axis, if we have two or more foci, if we have a ulcer that's three millimeters or more in diameter, those are ones that we're going to want to culture. And so if that's something we're thinking needs to culture, we don't want to put an antibiotic right away if you can get them to whoever you're referring to in a, in a, in a short amount of time, because we know any antibiotic we put inside the eye is going to decrease that bacterial load. It's going to interfere with that culture itself. And so, just talk to we know our phone or friends and how we want how we want to treat this. Uh, in the end, uh, yes, this was pseudomonas. Unfortunately, this not did not get better. And uh, this patient uh, ended up. No matter what we did, we had the broad spectrum antibiotics, the vancomycin, the fortified genomycin, 
vancomycin, we know is good gram positive, including MRSA. We know uh, genomycin is good gram positive, great gram negative, including pseudomonas. Uh, one thing that our cornea specialist does, they often put a, um, they'll do a subconjunctival injection of genomycin. And you'll have half the cornea specialists say, why are you even doing that? It's not going to penetrate into the cornea. It's not going to have any effect. However, our cornea specialist is like, well, we'd rather provide some coverage versus no coverage for the patient throughout the night. And so we will typically do a injection for those patients in addition to fortified antibiotics. But as I was alluding to, unfortunately, this patient did get worse and needed a penetrating keratoplasty. So that's one type of case we may see. And we also have this other one that we're all very familiar with. Anytime we see this dendritic ulcer, anytime we see those terminal end bulbs, yes, we can see this in, floor, in, uh, in the, with the fluorescein and the blue light in our rat and filter, although we don't need that filter. We utilize our, uh, our, our vital dyes. And we know that this is gonna stain, the live virus is gonna stain uh, the terminal end bulbs. And so we, if we have a live virus, we know we already know how to treat this. We know we have an FDA-approved treatment, topical gang cyclovir, one drop five times a day uh, for uh, until the epithelium heals over. And then after that, we want to do it three times a day for an extra week. Why? We want to make sure that we fully killed that virus. And uh, I, I have an example. Uh, one of our one of our residents years ago, they had a dendritic ulcer like this, and they put a, put the patient on gang cyclovir. And after a week, five times a day, said, oh, okay, you're good. You can stop the medication. Didn't do that extra week of the gang cyclovir. And the patient came back several days later with a geographic herpetic ulcer. And so we had to keep them on the drops longer and add, add the uh, oral antivirals as well. One of the issues, though, we know when it comes to the, the herpetic dendritic keratitis is that the insurance does not cover the FDA-approved uh, treatment, or if they do cover it, it's still quite expensive. And so oftentimes we utilize oral antivirals, whether it's acyclovir, we know the board's answer is 400 milligrams five times a day. However, anything we do less is more. And so, so what we'll typically do is prescribe 800 milligrams three times a day for the patient of acyclovir, or we'll use valacyclovir 500 milligrams three times a day that we know is effective into, into treating this, this type of ulcer. And so, uh, until this epithelium heals over, we have them on the antivirals. This is something we don't want to put steroids on. We know that if we see a if we see a lesion and we're not sure if it's herpetic or not, we do the steroid provocative test. Treat and follow. Good patient care. We can modify treatment. But if that patient comes back on steroids and it's worse, well, we know it's a virus. And so then we're going to treat it for a virus as well. And so, uh, so that, that's just more of a review for things that we're going to see within our, our clinics. So I, I mentioned already, you know, what is the most common risk factors for bacterial keratitis? And I think Greg had this as a polling question, but I already ruined it because I already said it was uh, contact lens wear. But trauma is another issue, poor hygiene, as well as the topical medications when it comes to the preservatives. And we know preservatives are essentially a detergent that can beat up that ocular surface and allow opportunity for microorganisms to contaminate or infect the eye. Bacterial keratitis risk factors, contact lens wear is going to be the number one risk factor, once again, pseudomonas. However, let's say a patient came in with an ulcer and, or even any type of infection around the eye, most likely that's going to be due to gram-positive staph. And so anytime we're prescribing, whether it's going to be topical, whether it's going to be oral, we want to make sure that we have good gram positive coverage to the microorganism. And if it's not getting any better within a couple of days, then we're going to have to take a step back. We're going to have to consider culturing to rethink our diagnosis to see what can be going on with our patient. So here's another patient that presents, and we're all familiar with this patient. 84-year-old white male that was referred from one of our colleagues and referred to me and said, hey, this patient came in, chronic conjunctivitis, has been utilizing moxifloxacin, and this was off-label brand Vigamox at the time, for three weeks, and also uh, lid scrubs. And it was not getting any better, so they sent him to me. And so 
we got to think, well, first, why are they sending? Well, they need a culture. It's not getting any better. And so we need to take a step, step back to figure out what's going on. And so I did the culture, took the, and so you can just contact the local labs and they're going to give you the, they're going to give you the, the culture swab and it's going to come into the culture media and they'll, they'll just talk to them. They'll send them to you. And so you don't want all the mucus. You want to kind of clean all that off, but just get, you know, just wipe it along the lashes, wipe it along the conjunctiva and you get a sample of what's going on or the microorganisms there. Or even if you have a uh, corneal ulcer, you can use the same uh, this same culture swab. Uh, our, our labs in Norfolk at the at the at the labs around here, we used to have the blood, chocolate, and sabrodes auger that we would culture for the, for these ulcers. But they went away with those, and they just said, "Hey, let's just do these because they all have a shelf life." And so they they just went with these cultured tubes, and you can just dig in the ulcer, send it off order susceptibility testing, and then they'll let you know what, what the microorganism is, but also what is the antibiotic that's susceptible to it, that can kill the microorganism, or what is resistant to it. And so we have to do something. Yes, I took the swab, sent it off. So what are we going to do? What is in our differential not getting any better? 84-year young patient. And so we need to think of what are some of the other antibiotics? What are some of the other treatments? So one of the things that does come to mind is MRSA. And so we want to prescribe something that is effective against MRSA. And we do know, so what I did is I put the patient on bezofloxacin, and this was indicated for uh, bacterial conjunctivitis, but uh, but use this off-label for, or well, this was conjunctivitis. And so this was on-label. Uh, but then also put the patient on doxycycline. We know, doc so first, bezofloxacin has not been used systemically. And so has been proven in, in case reports to be proven against uh, susceptible against MRSA. But then also doxycycline of the tetracycline class has about a 93% susceptibility to, to MRSA. Or even using something such as bacitracin has about 61% uh, susceptibility to MRSA. When the patient came back, the labs came in, I saw them in seven to 10 days, anything we were treating for, conjunctivitis, Blepharitis, dry eye, treat and follow, good patient care, modified treatment if the patient's not getting any better. This was positive for MRSA and the patient did resolve. And that's just a case where we have to, not getting any better, rethink our diagnosis. So and, many- uh, well, but, well, before you get yes, too far, a couple of questions came in about the uh, the first case, the pseudomonas ulcer. Uh -huh. uh, what did they do with their contact lenses? Was was it caused by sleeping in their contact lenses? Uh, with that patient, I believe it was due to uh, sleeping in the contact lenses. It was a while back we saw that patient. Uh, but yes, typically it's going to be the non-compliant contact lens patient, uh, extended wear longer than usual. And so uh, that was that case. That was it. You all caught up on the questions. All right, perfect. Thank you. So, indication for cultures, uh, you can see if it's if it's ugly looking, hyperacute, chronic, uh, central corneal ulcers, as I mentioned. Anytime that it's not getting any better, we need to consider culturing to to verify our diagnosis. So, those are just a couple fun well, cases. Well, yes, sir. Before, before you go to the next topic, if you can go back a little bit on culturing, you're sure. you're using the term culture a lot. Uh, yep. We're we're getting, you know, Greg and I, we're we're getting away from the word culture, and we're going to microbiologic assessment. We've been okay. using polym polymerase chain reaction assessments. Have you? Are you familiar with it? Have you done that? Or does do you do that in your office, or do you actually do you actually do the the grow this bug and see what kills it? So we actually just get the get the sample and we send it off to a lab. There's a lab down in Texas. That, uh, that gives us all the information that we need. Um, and so that's what we've typically used, but we don't typically do the PCR or grow it locally. Okay. Because we're, we're, we've been, we've been, we've gravitated toward PCR mm -hmm. and it's great in that you don't need a lot of inoculum and it comes back because they don't have to grow anything. It comes back fast. I mean, we now have about a two day turnaround time and uh -huh. we find out what's there and what it's susceptible mm -hmm. to. Now, grant it's it, it's very good for acanthamoeba. Mm -hmm. It's good for bacteria. It's only okay for fungus. Yeah. You know, one of the other things that we've been utilizing, and 
I just realized we got our new one, but our our confocal microscopy, our microscopy. So we've been utilizing that whenever patients come in. And if we take a look at the cornea, mm -hmm. we see the chaotic branching on the confocal, then it increases our suspicion that the patient has fusarium or fungal keratitis. Mm -hmm. Or as you mentioned, they can't amoeba. If we see those cystic areas within the confocal mm -hmm. scan, then we, we're thinking they can't amoeba, and then we're going to start that treatment. Yes, we still send out the labs, but then when it comes back, then we can mm -hmm. modify our yeah, the great great thing for us with with PCR, uh, they yeah you know, they provide everything. It's easy for an OD to get involved in it. It's easy to scrape, and the 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 new age culture at uh, you know I can scrape the entire cornea off. It's like a Brillo pad, and yeah. it, you know so the turnaround time is is excellent, mm -hmm. and they provide everything. You know within by by time I see them for follow up, I usually have I usually have the information. And I found it to be pretty accurate so far. So where are you sending? It? Is this to a local lab or, or who's doing? No, no, it? there, there are, there, there are national change. I'm not, I'm not promoting anything, but we use Health Track RX is the company. Now, what we would do, I, I would, I would on a Monday morning do a scraping, uh -huh. just like you know, transport media, uh, call mm -hmm. for a UPS pickup. It would go to Dallas, Texas. Now, it's actually going to Louisville, Kentucky. They've changed labs. Within about two days, I can log in and, and get my, 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 my microbiologic growth as well as the, uh, the sensitivity. Now, caveat, they don't, treat, they don't test a lot of ophthalmics either. But yeah. now, they, I, for some reason, they went away from Dallas now we're getting we're shipping it to uh, to Louisville, but it's it's very fast. Like I said two days. Okay, actually, th that when you brought the name up, my cornea specialist they've utilized that quite often uh, mm -hmm. for for some of their crazy cases as well. Yeah, my two cents on it before you move on to the cataract is that the nice thing about it is um, you don't have to worry about keeping the bacteria alive because it's using RNA and amplifying it. That's the polymerase chain chain reaction. And so, um, you know, you can numb the eye to do it. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you um, just need a little bit because, uh, and again, you don't have to worry about keeping it alive. Um, and, you know, I can be numb and you just need a little bit of RNA to be able to identify it. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, keep the questions coming. We'll keep the comments coming. I'm going to keep going here. So we're going to talk about about refractive uh, cataract surgery. And so we know that cataract surgery has changed. And so it's not the extra cap to just, you know, get a two by four and slap it on the eye and hope that lens drops and, and gets out of the way and give them some big glasses. You know, now we're taking out the cataract from the capsule and putting various technologies. And here you can see a multifocal IOL that we know uh, does offer patients decreased dependency on glasses and contact lenses, although we'll never say we eliminate those for patients. We know that cataract surgery is refractive surgery. We know that there's various trends when it comes to cataract care. You know, for us, as we as we see the demographics and the supply demand, by 2030, there's gonna be about a 30% increase in medical eye care services. There's also gonna be about a 30, 33% increase in the demand for cataract surgery. There's not enough surgeons around and, and uh, there's no growth within ophthalmology, but there is growth with optometry. And it's important for us to, to, to help our patients, educate them. The more educated the patient is throughout the process, even when they start to develop cataracts, they may not it may not be time for surgery, but whether it's two, three, four years down the road, letting them know it's an exciting time for cataract surgery because there's so much more we can do from now than we could in the past but also letting our patients know what our role is within the as the optometrist, whether you work within an integrated practice itself and working and seeing pre and post-ops, or if you're referring it to a center, uh, such as Center for Sight, uh, where Joe's at, and, and they do the surgery, let them know you're referring for cataract surgery, but then let them know that you do see the post-operative care, whether it's a one day, one week, one month, or whatever it may be, or whenever you're coming back. Uh, we know patients do have a higher expectation for visual outcomes. We know there's numerous technologies that are out there, and it's important to, and it's not for everybody, it's important that we match the technology to the patient, 
and the patience of the technology. And so here we know about the light intensity distribution between a monofocal, a diffractive, as well as extended depth of focus implant. And there's numerous companies out there and, uh, and, and we know that they do work as long as we match the patient technology and the technology to the patient. And so here's a lot of different ones where there's extended depth of focus. Uh, both j and and Alcon do have their versions. We have the tri trifocals as well, whether it's the various companies. Bottom left, guys, are you are you all working with surgeons that do the light adjustable lens? Yes. What are your thoughts on that so far? We don't have any experience. We're looking at that, but I'd love to know your mm -hmm. thoughts. Thoughts are good. I mean, uh, two to three, well, kind of four, but two, you know, mostly two, three of our surgeons really like it. They feel it really helps, particularly in those patients who've had uh, prior refractive surgery. So there's less of a surgical surprise. They can adjust it. Uh, for me, I mean, the, the outcomes are all are all going to be very similar when I, when I, when I'm seeing the patients, but it's a lot, it's a lot of elbow grease. So there's a lot of work. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of additional visits involved. And, you know, our, our, we have two ODs that are doing the, uh, the light adjustments. The so light adjustments. it's all, it's all very integrated. Uh, patients are doing very well. They, they had, they used to have to wear these three goggles, you know, they had three different goggles and they couldn't walk by a window or they, they catch on fire like a vampire or something like that. Well, the newer, the newer lenses that are coming out really don't necessitate that, but we kind of encourage them through outside to use the goggles, but inside they're okay. A little bit more leg work, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, effort involved, you know, more visits, but mm -hmm. those are, you know, with a, with a good surgery center and a good surgical scheduler, you'll get the, those, uh, you know, those exams all set. You know, and uh, one thing is you've got to really look for in two weeks the uh, posterior capsular pacification because if there's really any there, they got to get yagged first. Yep. Greg, any comments? The only comment I have is uh, practicing in Western Central uh, Pennsylvania. It just started mm -hmm. making it to this area. So I used to be in an ODMD practice. I'm not there anymore. Um, I think they might have just started doing it, you know, a few months back. Uh, so I have minimal experience other than listening to you and Joe and Justin Schweitzer and those, that crew that's out there talking about it. So I'm aware of it, but no comments. Yeah, it, it is very exciting technology. We're looking at it. Joe just mentioned the ideal candidates post refractive. You can definitely nail that target for the patient. For me and my practice, even though we're looking at it for those patient types, I'm trying to do less post-op visits is what we're trying to do within our practice. Mm -hmm. It's exciting, clinically inefficient uh, technology. Uh, like for us, so we don't even do one-day post-op uh, post visits anymore. Uh, the biggest thing we're looking for at post-ops is going to be pressure. And so we, as long as there's no contraindications, we give our patients acetazolamide at the end of the procedure. Everybody gets, uh, gets bimonidine and dorzolamide twice a day for a week. We do have a OD call that patient so that we have a OD that calls about 30, 35 patients a day. And this is only for standard cataract surgery, not a combined MIGS, not a combined DSEC or cornea procedure and said, how's your vision? Any pain, any, any problems? If they are, we'll say, hey, come on in the office. We'll see you. If they're not, they do have to come in the office at the one week post-op. And so this is in response to COVID while we're trying to social distance. And so we've done probably about 25,000 patients this way and a great success. So we don't see us looking back anytime soon. Uh, other implants, you can see the one with the pinhole. And so that's the IC8 uh, aphthera. And so this is for the non-dominant eye. This can be used in post-refractive patients. It can be used in post-RK, a regular stigma or regular cornea patients where you put this in the non-dominant eye. It can correct up to about a diopter and a half of astigmatism, but it also increases the depth of focus for the patient. And yes, we still see the ring. It has 3,200 micro perforations, but we're able, you know, we're still able to look at the eye with our 90, with our BIO. If the patient has glaucoma, they could still do their visual fields as well. And so this has been an exciting addition to our practice. And then on the bottom right, you see the toric IOL. The only contraindication of the toric IOL 
is no corneal astigmatism. Uh, it's a great option for patients. We know the closer to the nodal point of the eye uh, is going to give the patient the best quality of vision. And so here's a game we like to play, or I guess <laughs> me and my, my surgeons like to play. Uh, would you ever replace a monofocal ILL with a presbyopia correcting ILL? In our practice, we don't. There are some practices that do. Um, and so it's going to be surgeon dependent. We know that each time we go inside the eye, that increases the risk of complications. And so for those patients that have monofocal, it, we let them know there are new, there are several supplemental IOLs in the work that will likely go in the sulcus, uh, in the posterior sulcus, and provide some vision. Other options we have for those patients, we know we have uh, the presbyopia drops. Orisys is coming up. We know that there's Allergan, had there's Orisys. Whether you like those drops or not, there's about eight more coming. And so this is something we, as the eye care provider, need to make sure that we're aware of it, educate our patients, and let them know, hey, whether they're a, a, a patient or a, a ideal candidate, or if they're not, give them other options as well. Because if we don't offer it, then they're going to go to someone else that does offer it. Do a YAG on a one-month post-op. I'll talk about that in a case here shortly. Mix and match IOLs. We used to do this with the earlier versions of the IOLs when they had a, uh, let's say the Technus platform had a low, medium, and high ad, or with the initial re Alcon Restore platform, where one of them gave great distance in their immediate, other gave great distance in near with okay intermediate. So we used to do that, but uh, with the newer IOLs, they if they if they want the full range of vision. Trifocals are great together. Uh, extended depth of focus. We do do a little bit different where we'll do the dominant eye first, nail the distance vision, and then afterwards see how good the reading is. The reading's good, we'll just match the same. Uh, we we'll shoot for Plano on the non-dominant eye, but if they need a little bit more near they, or, or intermediate, then we'll back off on the non-dominant eye for the patient. And then for presbyopia correcting IOLs with moderate and dry eye, if we can't control the dry eye, the patient is not a candidate for any of the multifocal or trifocal technologies, but they would still be a candidate if we can control it for an extended depth of focus, which is more forgiving. Uh, actually, our glaucoma specialist is excited about the extended depth of focus implants because there's not all those rings. So we're not losing contrast sensitivity. So they're still offering it to our mild to moderate macular degeneration patients and our mild to moderate glaucoma patients as well. Uh, here's a case, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through this case. I'll highlight a couple things here. Um, here, whenever we're doing our evaluation, a couple things that we want to look at is the K measurements. If the patient has a half a diopter or more of corneal astigmatism, those patients are candidates for astigmatism treatment. Whether it's going to be with manual LRIs or with femtosecond LRIs where we'll typically use those between half a diopter to a diopter of corneal astigmatism. Because as we know, with total corneal astigmatism, once we take the lens out, the only thing that patient's left with is gonna be what's at the corneal plane. Anything over a diopter, those are patients where we're gonna typically recommend a toric IOL uh, for those patients. We do utilize OCT, a part of our package, our elective package, where here you can see the patient with an epiretinal membrane. And so if we have those patients, you know, maybe they are motivated. This, in this case, this patient had monovision. Her vision was still functional. I think she was, I skipped the slide, the 2030, 2025 uh, in, the, in the near eye. And so they're still interested in that. And for surgery, if, the, if you have a patient that has been successful monovision, let your surgeon know. They've been successful monovision. Let them, and then we'll keep it that way. But if they want more binocularity, if they want the increased range of vision, then that's a discussion that, that we can initiate with the patient, but then the surgeon uh, give the, the surgeon that information so they can have that lengthy discussion. But typically, anytime there's an epiretinal membrane, those are not patients, whether it's monovision or not monovision, those are patients we are not going to elect a, diffra a diffractive or a multifocal IOL because anything that can compromise best corrected vision is not something that we would offer for our patient. And so um, who isn't a candidate for advanced technology IOLs? Mentioned if they have over a half the after of astigmatism, you know, we're going to correct for that. And we're going to offer that to the patient as part of the informed consent. Just like many of us, you know, if we're going to prescribe a pair of glasses, 
patient has two diopter of astigmatism, we're not going to prescribe spherical lenses for that patient. We're going to correct that astigmatism. That same case goes for cataract surgery. Uh, if that patient has high expectations that a type A plus patient where you know no one better put a multifocal or a trifocal lens in that patient, make sure you communicate to, that, to your surgeon that this patient is going to push you. They're going to say this is going to be a great option, but this is not going to be the best option for the patient because they do not have realistic expectations. After surgery, we know most patients, they're doing great. They're happy. The monofocal, we set the expectations, the toric, the, 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 the presbyopia correcting lenses. However, if we have unhappy patients, the most common reason for unhappy patients is un undiagnosed and undertreated dry eye prior to surgery. You have dry eye before surgery, you identify it, treat it, it's the patient's problem. If you identify after surgery, it's a gift that keeps on giving, especially when it comes to the presbyopia correcting uh, IOLs. And so always treat the dryness first. Once, that, uh, once you get the dryness under control, then refer it for surgery. After surgery, you know, the patients are going to be in anti-inflammatories for about three to four or three to four weeks. At that time, about a, a study showed that about a third still have dry eye. And so then we may uh, that uh, low threshold for prescribing an immunomodulator, maybe a, uh, a evaporative uh, prescription medication. We have great options for our patients. PCO, we'll typically gag a PCO as early as a month if the patient uh, was happy with the IOL. Dysphotopsias, typically, uh, typically those do go away uh, over time. Best way to describe it to the patients is reflections off the incision and the implant neuroadaptation the patient does improve. But then also the near point. We'll have those patients that come in, they have, Doc, you, you say my vision's great, but I can't see, and you can tell me I'm J2 or J1. So what do I do? Well, let's say they have the, uh, the, the trifocal lens. Well, I'll grab minus two or minus 250 uh, loose lenses. I'll give them some reading material, have them read, and then I'll put them in front of their eyes. And they're like, wait a second, I can't see. And so I just encourage them. I say, hey, these implants are working. It's just going to take time for your brain to adapt, adapt to it. And so here's, a, here's the only other case I have for cataract surgery. A uh, patient had a presbyopia correcting IOLs. And you can see this was a few years ago. And then about a month later, a couple months later, referred back for, uh, by the optometrist for a YAGI valve. The patient had blur, trouble with fluorescent lights, difficulty driving due to halos. And this is one of the multifocals. Doesn't seem right after surgery. You can see the vision and does glare. And then PC note, PCO noted on the exam and then uh, got them with uh, got them uh, with with the surgeon. And so for this patient, anytime they've had a multifocal IOL or trifocal IOL, it's important to ask them, you know, were you happy? Were they happy at day one with their distance intermediate near? Were they happy at week one, distance intermediate near? Were they happy at one month? And if they were happy any of those time, then we'll consider a YAG because we know that they were happy, the PCO developed, and so we YAG it, the patient's gonna be happy again. But if they were mad at the one day, one week or one month, we do not wanna YAG those patients because then, uh, then, it, then surgeons are less likely going to do an IOL exchange and my surgeons won't do it why? Because it's a very difficult procedure and also increased risk of complications and dropping the lens in, in the back of the eye. And so why not perform the YAG? It takes time for the brain to adapt to the IOL. So I encourage the patient, treat the surface. Uh, if the patient can adapt, you know, get the surgeon involved, just reassure the patient because they, you know, we want them happy. The patient wants them happy. Let them know we're communicating with the, with the surgeon and we're going to work together to come up with a plan. And so don't perform a YAG until the IOL exchange is ruled out. Have a plan in place with your surgeon. If the patient, no matter, you know, for their surgery, if they're not happy with their, their you know, we have a checklist. What's the refractive error? Is it, is it repeatable and stable? Look for any ocular surface disease. Rule out OC, uh, CME. And then, uh, and then, you know, if it, it's time for the YAG or IOL exchange, then we'll talk with the surgeon there. Um, they can talk about the enhancements that the patient does need it, but going back to having that plan in place with your surgeon. And so uh, any comments on any of that there, Joe or, or Greg? 
No, no, I, I, I was, uh, I, I agree with everything you say there. I thought, uh, I think, I think it's really pretty interesting. You're right. You know, at some point, they have to be happy. If they weren't happy, and you know, it, uh, it's not just going to be the ag. And you know, that's one of those things you really can't go back from. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. So here's another post-operative case, weekend emergency, decreased vision, foggy, no pain. 2200 in the in the right eye or yeah, the right eye. You can see the pressures. Had a lot of cells. And typically, uh, you know, typically after surgery, we did the surgery on a on a Thursday. We used to post op on Friday. And so this patient came on the weekend at three to four plus cells. So why does it go from one to two plus to three to four plus? Had a PVD, had some vitreous cell as well dot hemes and whitening throughout the periphery. And so my, one of my partners, they saw the patient said, yes, increased post-operative inflammation and increase the steroid every hour, the Pafinac and the uh, uh, Nevinac, this is years ago, three times a day, kept them on the moxifloxus. And so this was actually on Sunday, so two days later. And so we need to think, patient, why did they go from 2030, 2040, which I left that slide out, to 2200 with decreased vision, foggy, but no pain. If that patient's in pain, worsening vision, we're thinking endophthalmitis. And so this patient, this had worsening vision, no pain. And so it was due to maybe the inflammation. You know, where does the PVD come into place? It wasn't there preoperatively. Patient wasn't in any pain or discomfort, but does have some dot hemorrhages in the periphery. And so the differentials, typically you will see toxic anterior segment syndrome, uh, at the one-day post-op, you can see the inflammatory fibrin or the or the, uh, the the accumulations of the stringy uh, inflammatory proteins that are building up in TAS, whether it's due to you know something that happened during the uh, during the uh, the disinfection of the surgical uh, tools or the autoclave, and when we see this on the left, patients have a lot of pain, so we're going to increase the steroids on that, but we're going to watch that patient closely looking posteriorly, making sure that there's no cells in the vitreous, because the more cells that are in the vitreous, more likely that the patient does have an infectious component, which we know on the right eye, there's a picture that I took from the internets, uh, where you can see the hypopion, cloudy vision, red eye that the patient does have. So we have a polling question. What is the most common organism found in bacterial endophthalmitis? A, Staph aureus. B, uh, epidermidus, uh, epidermis, three, strep pneumonia, or D, homophilus uh, influenza. And so uh, there, was a, there was a study uh, looking at the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study where they found that oh, 69... Hold on, pa 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 pause there, let the poll happen, if you would. Oh, I know you want to I know you want to kind of grind away at this as a typical webinar, but... Um... Oh, I was going to go slow. I was waiting for it to come up. Yeah, you're not going to see it on your end uh, the way okay. it is, but the poll is launched. Okay, um, it's it's happening. Because okay. with that uh, being said, um, there's a few questions that rolled in. Um, they would like to know what is the lab you use for cultures. I put Health Tracks Health Track RX is the PCR company. Do you know the name of the culture company that you use in Texas? Me, I I, I use yeah. the local. Uh, my local cultures. All right, the so hospital. you're using local. Yep. Okay. He's using he so he's going local. Mm -hmm. He's not using a, a Texas company. Joe and I are using Texas for Health Tracks RX. All right. Then it says, uh, why do you want to treat dry eye prior to surgery? That's a great question, and uh, that's a whole nother lecture. Uh, when it comes to dry eye, there's been several studies that show that. Uh, let's say Trattler's study, uh, the FACO study, 136 patients came in for a routine cataract evaluation. They wanted to determine how many patients had dry eye, a moderate or, or severe dry eye. And what they found is 80% of patients had the dry eye signs and symptoms, yet only 22% of patients were diagnosed. The reason we want to treat that prior to surgery is because if we have an unstable tear film. The cornea tear film interface accounts for two thirds of the refracting power of the eye. If we have poor measurements on the biometry, and essentially it's going to be how long the eye is, how round the eye is, and the surgical factors, 
If we're off on those Ks, that can leave that patient plus one or minus one after the procedure. And as we know, patients have higher expectations. Uh, I have a slide in a different lecture where we were comparing, and one of my partners, Liz Yu, where we had a patient pre-surgery, right eye was maybe 44, average K, left eye was a 42, maybe some hot spots on the on the uh, on the topography. We treated that we treated the dryness. Patients were both 43 K measurements. So if we based our, our biometry off the initial Ks, that patient would have been almost two diopters in their outcome. And so if you know patients, they want good outcomes, their sister, brother, person at church has good vision. That's why we do it. There's numerous other studies I could reference. Priya Gupta had a study. Actually, Liz, you had a study. 397 patients came in for her cataract evaluation. It's retrospective. She found that 95% of patients had grade one meibomian gland atrophy or more. About 45% of those patients had 50% or more of gland atrophy. And so it is very prevalent. And it's because we want to maximize or optimize our outcomes. And patients want good outcomes. If you tell a patient, now oh, you have dry eye, but you go get cataract surgery, you want crappy outcomes, they're going to, of course, say no. They're going to say, hey, you know, what can we do to get, to get us the best outcome? So that's why. In my yeah, I'm just going to kind of echo what you said there, uh, Walt, just to kind of what I like to always ask the audience, you know, what's the, you know, total diopter power of the eye? You know, I think we all know it's about 60. And we all look at Ks all day long and we see that they're 44. And that's where um, Walt came up with that two thirds, right? So if you think total power of the eye is 60, cornea tear film interface is uh, 44, you're talking 66% or two thirds. Now, with that being said, those IOL measurements are taken from that cornea. So if your cornea is inflamed, if it's swollen, you're not just going to get those accurate measurements. Now, you know, a patient is best corrected to 2050 because of macular degeneration. It's a macular problem. You still want to try and get the best refractive outcome, but maybe it's not as critical. And it's super critical with patients that are going for these specialty IOLs that, that, that uh, Walt was talking about. Um, because, you know, if they're paying thousands of dollars out there for these packages, you know, you don't want to be off and have to do LASIK and PRK for all these touch-ups. You'd rather get it fixed with that IOL. Um, the other question came in is, what do you think about dropless cataract surgery? Dropless cataract surgery, that's a great option. I know many, many surgeons, uh, there's a handful of surgeons in our area that are doing it. Uh, one, of, one of my partners, uh, Tom Edmonds, he does that. And he has great success with it. Uh, within, our, within our practice, we have not gone that route. Uh, we do compounded drops uh, where we have a combination of antibiotic, anti-inflammatories as well, both uh, non-steroidal and a steroidal. And so we have the cost at about forty dollars per eye. Uh, for those that were on dropless, uh, you know, there, I've heard some people are still using non-steroidal. So is it truly dropless? It's all sur surgeon preference. Um, so just talk to your surgeons about that. Yeah, dropless is nice. Uh, we had a surgeons in our area doing it at once, and they kind of migrated away from it because of the macular edema. And then you know, then it's a bear to treat that. Um, the surgeon that comes into my practice does a little sub uh injection of some steroids, and then he does the uh, combination of, you know, uh, prednisolone, uh, an NSAID, and, and GADI, uh, gadifloxacin, uh, one drop once a day. So we're kind of almost droplets that's out there. Well, this question didn't come in, but I have a question for you. If you needed to have cataract surgery right now, knowing what you know with your practice, mm -hmm. Or Joe, you can you can weigh in on this because you do it. I don't have this much in my practice. And you were going to go for a specialty IOL to try to minimize your dependency, see distance, see up close. What's the technology you would reach for right now? Yeah. Or would you, you know, have for in me, your eye? So for me, I'm really excited about the uh, extended depth of focus lenses. I've been very happy with, with the Vividi. It doesn't have those rigs. It sharpens the distance vision and it gives intermediate as well. Uh, being 48-ish years, years young, started with the multifocal contact lenses. So I'm feeling it uh, right now, but I've been very happy and my patients have been very happy with the extended depth of focus lenses. Joe? 
Well, I can't really make that decision because I've, it's too late for me. I've had cataract surgery. Uh, I got my cataracts early. I, I began in my 40s. Uh, I kind of agree. I, I would actually work with the surgeon and, you know, somebody I trusted and, and see what she or he wanted to do, you know, based on the fact that I was a previous high myope. I was uh, probably nine or 10 diopters myopic, and I got early LASIK uh, in the 90s. So we had that consideration, but I had a a single vision uh, IOL put in. I've been, I've been, I've done fine. Yes. So I really didn't think about it. I would probably work with one of the surgeons I trust here, if 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 that were an option, and see what they wanted, what they would think best for me. But uh, Vividi do, does sound pretty interesting. All right. Well, the answer to your poll is sixty six percent said staph aureus. We have twenty nine percent with staph epidermidis. Uh, we have uh, five percent with uh, staph pneumoniae and zero with H influenza. Okay, well, perfect. Well, thanks for for uh, joining that poll. Here you can see sixty nine percent were uh, with bacterial endophthalmitis were culture positive. Seventy percent were staph epidermidis. Twenty four percent were other gram positives, and then six percent were gram negatives. Um, you know, this is what you were just talking about with your surgeon, uh, Greg, that puts a little bit of the uh, antibiotic. We do that as well. So we do put intracameral moxifloxacin in all of our patients at, at the end of surgery, uh, but we still do give them the, uh, the, 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 the combination drops here. I'm not going to go into this whole study, but there was 315,000 patients and this came out of Kaiser. And the purpose was to look at the intracameral injection. Is it, a, is it is an effective method for preventing infection um, for, for patients? And you can see the conclusion. Uh, surgical complication remains a key risk factor for endophthalmitis. Intracameral antibiotic is more effective for preventing post-cataract -cater endophthalmitis than topical antibiotics alone. Topical antibiotic was not shown to add to the effectiveness of an intracameral regimen. Well, we talked about it within my group. We said, well, that sounds good, but we're still going to put the patient on an antibiotic. And so uh, we do that to prevent uh, endophthalmitis or decrease the risk. So the patient came in on Monday, wasn't on pain, and didn't have pain on Sunday, but has pain on Monday. Vision went from 2200 to 2400. Now central stating, you know, was it a dendritic two plus cells? So the steroid did help. Still had a lot of vitreous cell. And as I mentioned, the more posterior, more likely an infectious cause, and then dot hemes and retinal whitening for the patient. And so what does she have? And so our within our differential was pa the patient had acute retinal necrosis. And so we gave them uh, some antivirals uh, intravitrally, gave them some uh, uh, pain medication. I probably should have used generic names here. Uh, Valet cyclovir, 1,000 milligrams, eight hours, uh, every eight hours for 10 days. And uh, and then the, did the blood cultures for you can see everything there, but we could not rule out bacterial endophthalmitis, and so we did still give the patient the vancomycin and simtazidine and sent the specimen to the lab. And so the labs came back; it was positive for varicella zoster, and so um, acute retinal acute retinal necrosis is a necrotizing herpetic retinitis that may present unilaterally or bilaterally in 20% of patients. Typically happens in the young, healthy adults, but this patient was 60 -ish years young. Uh, caused by infection of herpes zoster or herpes simplex. History of the inflammation, but rapid decline in vision with, with an intense vitritis. The clinical signs of peripheral whitening that you heard me mention several times for this patient. And you know, when we're looking at the botrytis, if you can't see the nerve, then that's going to be a grade three. If you can't see nothing, that's a grade four botrytis that the patient has. So this is a diagnosis based on clinical examination. You can do the PCR, retinal biopsy. And so here's the management, as you can see here. And so we wanted to send that patient to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the hospital to get IV acyclovir antivirals. Uh, but unfortunately, as many of us know, that there's these insurance plans and she had a high deductible plan and she says, I don't care. And this was actually one of our technicians' mom. She goes, I don't care what you say. I'm not going. She goes, I can't afford it. I'm not going there. 
What are other options? And so uh, Hume did a study looking at the oral antivirals and using Valtrex. And there's high uh, bioavailability within the vitreous. And so what we told her is, well, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do the Valtrex uh, 500 or 1,000 milligrams three times a day. If it does not start clearing up, you have no choice but go to the ER. And thankfully, she did get better. You can see there is an increase or there is a risk of retinal detachment. And if that happens, we have our treatments, whether it's laser foot coagulation of pars plane of vitrectomy. The pearls here, if a patient calls with symptoms of sudden decrease in vision or pain during the first week, this is an emergency. And so if you're co-managing and collaborating on surgical care, make sure we treat the patient. Treat it as infectious until proven otherwise. I mentioned the more posterior, the inflammation, more likely there's an infectious cause. And then collaboration and communication is succeed to successful co-management. Um, and so any that's all I have on cataracts. Uh, any questions that came up on anything? You are caught up on questions, but I can launch this poll here. Okay. So which is a corneal endothelial dystrophy? And Fuchs dystrophy, Salzman nodular dystrophy, anterior basement membrane dystrophy, although it depends on what coast you live on because it's epithelial basement mem membrane dystrophy on different coasts, I realized. I used to practice in Nevada, and then uh, now I'm in Virginia, and it's all the same thing. And then crocodile chagrin dystrophy. And so we know that there's different treatments for all of these, and we'll talk about the treatments uh, for these. Okay. Polls are uh, people are rolling in with the with the with the responses, and um, I believe we are caught up on questions. And so, with that said, go back to the poll. All right, I think I think they have spoken. I'll show the display. We have 96% saying Fuchs dystrophy. Good. And so it, that's the correct answer. It's going to be Fuchs dystrophy. We know Salzman and anterior basement mem mem membrane dystrophy is going to be more on the superficial layers. And then crocodile chagrin, that's more on the posterior stroma, that, but that does not uh, necessarily interfere with vision. Uh, Salzman nodular and anterior basement membrane dystrophy. Depending on the severity of it, uh, we can do a superficial keratectomy, and I'll show you a video on that shortly. We often do those in patients, uh, let's say they're they're pseudofake, and they're complaining about their vision. Uh, the, you know, the, it's not dryness. We put the fluorescein in. Let's say they have ABMD. We see all those fingerprints and the maps. And so if we just polish that surface, then we can smooth it out. We're able to improve patient's vision by one or two lines. For patients with Salzman nodular de de degener or dystrophy, uh, we know that uh, uh, it's degeneration. I, so actually, I, I'm wrong on that one. Uh, but either way, we know that there is, it's either due to chronic inflammation. Actually, they don't know the real cause, dry eye, inflammation, whatever it may be. But there is a faulty basement membrane. And so you have irregular uh, epithelium or holes within basement membrane that are leading up to these nodules. And so if we're basing K measurements, let's say for cataract surgery, off these irregular, non-smooth K measurements, that can keep that patient uh, with decreased vision afterwards. And so another case where we would consider Salzman uh, uh, or, or a superficial keratectomy. So here's a patient several years ago, 74-year-old white male presents for cataract evaluation. You can see the best corrective vision is 2050 in the right, 2060 in the left, back to 2200. Medical history, you can see three plus scutata, three plus nuclear sclerosis. You can see the differences between the uh, pachymetry. And so what do you recommend for this patient? And so some of the considerations we have is first, we need to look at the cornea. We need to look at the cataract. So what is guttata? We know guttata is abnormal accumulations of collagen on the posterior corneal surface that over time, if that causes decreased vision, if this causes haze or let's say swelling, then those are patients that have fuchs uh, that's due to a compromise uh, endothelial pumps on the cornea. Uh, on the right, you know, said three plus nuclear sclerosis, I would say roughly this is about one to two plus if that. 
Grade two cataract, you can still get that patient at 2020, 2025. Grade three, maybe 2030, 2040. Grade four, we know that's going to be much worse. And so anytime we see this patient, is it the cornea or is it the cataract? And so a case like this, um, some of the considerations we have is, you know, how do you manage this patient? Well, we're not sure if it's due to the cornea swelling. We saw uh, we saw 394 or 694 and 630 something. And so we don't know if that's their normal PACI or not. So what can we do? Sodium chloride drops. We can also give that patient anti-inflammatories to decrease the swelling. We know that Fuchs is associated with inflammation, age, trauma, whatever it may be. So we put them on uh, sodium flor uh, fluorescein or not, sodium chloride, we put them on a steroid, check the pressure. Anytime you're prescribing a steroid, check the pressure, check the nerves. If anyone is going to respond, that's going to be a glaucoma patient. Bring them back in a month if the, and do the packies again and check the pressure. If, and the refraction, if it's better, great. If it's the, if the packies better, great. If the vision's better, great. Then we know it's the, the cornea. But if it's not any better, then we have to think, well, it, it's either both that's going on with, with, within the eye. And so we may need to consider a combined procedure. So whether it's a pachymetry, whether it's going to be confocal microscopy is something, typically it's more in referral centers or large surgical practices they have that, where we can see the endothelial cell count. When do you consider a surgical intervention? Well, let's say it's a Fuchs patient. Let's say they've already had cataract surgery. It's a Fuchs patient. Maybe they're 20, 30, 20, 40. Oftentimes, we'll tell them to use a mirror, we'll give them steroids, we'll treat the dryness, and we'll say, well, you tell us. When your vision, you're not happy with your vision, if it starts to get worse, we're happy to consider doing a corneal transplant on you. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a cataract and both, sometimes we'll just do both. We'll do a combined DMEC or DSO procedure with a cataract to, to address all areas that can compromise the vision. So this hey, is well a... Well, yes, what, what about in those patients? Have you had any experience with the rol kinase inhibitor? That's once a, 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 once a day. Question. Hold on that answer. Yeah, I'm going to hold on that answer after I present this case. Okay, very good. Uh, but we have, we have used that on some patients. And so here, this is a corneal transplant evaluation. And so one of my uh, cornea partners here, uh, blurry vision in the right eye, vision's clear in the left was already on sodium chloride and pred to acetate. So, and here you know the vision, had cataract surgery. Um, actually, it was the same patient, my bad, uh, a few years prior. Uh, history of, 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 uh, of herpes and so on, preventative dose, uh, valacyclovir. You see the vision 2070, 2030. Uh, only the cataract was done years prior. So here... Uh, slit lamp exam, four plus confluent guttata and bullae, stromal edema, but also had a dendritic ulcer. Left eye, three plus guttata, no stromal edema. And you can see the package was very similar to what it was uh, several years prior. So what do you recommend for the patients? Well, since they had the herpes there and they were on the steroids uh, already, uh, you know, we the meds that we're going to prescribe for the patient is we're, we're going to increase both of those, uh, the steroid and the sodium chloride, because there's the swelling and the bullet, we're going to schedule the DMAC once the virus is healed. And um, but because the uh, herpes, my partner stopped the steroid because we know that can turn it into a geographic herpetic ulcer. Put the patient on gang cyclovir five times a day. Put the patient on valley cyclovir 500 milligrams three times a day. Follow up in a week. This is how he treated it. I'm not going to go into the herpetic eye disease study. You could typically pick one or the other in this case. He wanted to kill the virus quickly because he's trying to get that patient to get that corneal transplant. So one week later, the virus did resolve, uh, did the uh, PI uh, a couple weeks after that and the DMEC after that. Uh, here's a video of a DMEC if you haven't seen this. Surgery this is a sword uh, and strip. This is from uh, uh, Aaron Bronner and PCLI, Dr. Guzek. And is the audio surgery. coming through? Uh, the remaining it is. is going to be. I use this so it gives me a break from talking. Graft preparation is a delicate process here uh, with about 10% tissue wastage with the MEC grafts. Uh, the transplant is drawn into an injector. 
which is used to inject the scrolled transplant into the anterior chamber of the host. The transplant is stained with tripan blue to help facilitate visualization during the uh, uh, transplant process. Here's where the Demec surgery uh, begins to become challenging, more challenging, uh, as the surgeon is forced to use percussive waves to get it to unfold. Simply grabbing the transplant and unscrolling it would result in endothelial failure and graft failure ultimately. Once the graft is appropriately positioned, uh, a full air fill is put into the anterior chamber, in this case with high density gas, and the surgery is essentially complete. And so that was that was the video I had. Um, I've done this lecture with Aaron Bronner before. Uh, but here, if we look at the for the DMEC, uh, it is a graft of decimase membrane only, uh, or decimase membrane and endothelium only. DSEC, which is decimase stri stripping, uh, surgeons are essentially removing about 150 microns of posterior stroma, as well as decimase membrane endothelium. You do get better visual outcomes. Although it is difficult to manipulate, one of the biggest things that we do see early on is graft dislocation, so it never it never took. And so at the post-op, whether it's one day, one week, early within the first several weeks, we're doing anterior, uh, uh, anterior segment OCT or uh, the cornea to see is that graft attached or not. If it's not, then we're going to get it pay back to the surgeon to reinflate uh, uh, air or gas back into the anterior chamber but there's decreased risk of rejection with, with the D, D Mac. Um, any of the complications, uh, whether it's going to be the graft dislocation, whether it's going to be uh, glaucoma, we know anytime you have a, a transplant patient, uh, they're on steroids and steroids decrease risk for, for graft rejection. However, anytime you have a patient on steroids, they're a glaucoma patient for life. And so we're still seeing those patients every four to six months, checking the pressure, we're checking uh, we're checking uh, OCT and visual field. Uh, I had a patient uh, where it was uh, 15 years after we did a transplant uh, that he finally had a steroid response and developed glaucoma over time. And so something that we do have to monitor for our patients. Uh, Long-term maintenance, I try to, I have a ton of slides here, so I didn't put all the studies in here. But as I mentioned, we keep the patient on a topical steroid, uh, unknown length of graft viability. Uh, there's there's no really long-term data. For PKs, roughly a, a full thickness corneal transplant lasts about 20 years. And so the patient may need another transplant. You're going to start seeing cornea specialists just doing either a DSEC or DMEC on a, on a PK because we know even with a PK that endothelium can decompensate over time. And so they're still gonna need a healthy donor tissue down the road uh, for that patient. So same patient, right eye got better. Down the road, three years later, blurry, uh, uh, the blurry vision, the OD is okay, but the left eye is, is cloudy. And so the patient's on prednisolone once a day, sodium chloride twice a day. Uh, you can see had the DMEC a few years ago. Uh, 2020 in the right, 2030 minus in the left. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you what we did is we did a decimate stripping only procedure on this patient. And so if a patient, if they have the fuchs within the central four millimeters, four to five millimeters of the, of the, of the cornea, then what surgeons can do is they can just remove that central uh, decimase and central endothelium and then allow the body to heal itself uh, as well. And so this is an area where we are using uh, uh, natarsidil. It's off label here because we know it's for, for glaucoma. But to answer your question earlier, Joe, we have used for patients with fuchs to help uh, help patients uh, with with uh, with fuchs dystrophy using rokinase inhibitors and have had success with that as well. And so here's my partner, Albert Chung, uh, doing the decimate stripping only. And pretty much all you're going to see is he's going to put Visco in it. He's going to mark it. And then he's just going to strip that central four millimeters. And the candidates for this decimated stripping only, they have to have viable uh, endothelium uh, uh, in, the per in the periphery. And so uh, cell counts there. We've probably done a dozen of these procedures uh, so far on patients in the last uh, six months. Uh, uh, and so we've been very happy with these outcomes. 
when we look at corneal transplants, and so one of the issues down the road is, are there enough donors, you know, to go around and the cost of donor tissue for the, for the dissection, the, the, uh, uh, the storage and, and, and the eye banks, it's roughly about $3,500 per uh, uh, donor tissue. Uh, you're, you're, you're in clinical research right now, they're looking at uh, uh, harvesting the endothelial cells. And so we'll try to find ways where they could do uh, in the labs right now is to replicate the corneal endothelium. Uh, but uh, hopefully in the near future, there's a way that we can do this in vivo with patients as well. And so that's decimate stripping only. Uh, indications, they have to have central guttata, clear peripheral cornea, as I just mentioned, but we can do this on fake X or pseudo fakes. But if they have any of the things on bottom, then those patients are not going to be candidates uh, for it. Just to show you some studies, uh, you know, what is the vision afterwards? Not a huge sample size, but in of 13, four eyes demonstrated res resolution of corneal edema uh, by one month. And you can see the vision 2025 to 2040 four eyes by three months, and then two eyes by six months for those patients with the final range of vision, pretty good in 10 of those 13 eyes. Predictive factors, they were trying to see, uh, you know, you know whether it's age, pachymetry, endothelial cell count, if it really mattered on, on the predict predictive factors for patients who are having these procedures, and it, it, it really didn't matter. Um, but if they looked at decimates only versus DMEC for the treatment of Fuchs, uh, this is a retrospective study of 27 eyes. Yeah, in the end, both eyes got, uh, got good vision. It was quicker within the DMEC group versus the decimate stripping only group. However, there was less complications in the decimate stripping only group versus the DMEC group. And so you're going to start hearing a lot more about this and you're going to see, see more and more uh, surgeons and studies going forward. And then here's looking at the topical rokinase inhibitors in the treatment of Fuchs dystrophy after base, after decimate stripping only. And as we know that uh, the rokinase inhibitors promote corneal endothelial wound healing in the animal models. And so this is something that has been utilized with success. Uh, small sample size, but you're gonna hear more and more about this down the road complications. This will be in your notes uh, as well. And so for this patient, just to go quickly through it, uh, the patient was, you know, uh, 20, 30, cloudy cornea, was, it wasn't as sharp as he wanted. And then you could see one month later, then two months later, but then three months later, the patient was about 20, 25 afterwards. And so that's a pretty exciting transplant that we've been doing within our practice. I'll open up to questions well, here. Could, yeah, could, go for could it. you go back? Could you go back one? For anybody out there who's not experienced this, uh, the 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 one on the left, it's a very classic uh, honeycomb type of appearance, and you should expect to see that. And this is actually pretty slow recovery. We we've done some of it, and I you know, I I, I had one patient who d had cataract surgery, and uh, we call it the DWEC, and a DWEC. And, you know, she was quite anxious. We had to postpone surgery in her other eye because, you know, her vision was really poor. It took, it took months before it recovered, and it did, And but then it failed, and she had to have a uh, DMAC. But that classic honeycomb appearance is what you're going to see, what people, if people come across this out there in the audience, it's a very mm -hmm. dense honeycomb appearance uh, essentially in the cornea, and it's a very slow recovery. Yeah, yeah for sure. And then I mentioned for the anterior corneal dystrophies, whether it's the Salzman in the top, ABMD in the in the in the middle. I'll, we already talked about the fuchs on the on the left. So this is just doing a superficial keratectomy, where essentially just putting diluted alcohol on the ocular surface, removing the sick epithelium. So whether this is due to ABMD, whether this is due to let's say recurrent corneal erosion. The difference between ABMD and recurrent corneal erosion on this treatment is if it was due to recurrent corneal erosion, we would use a diamond burr to polish that basement membrane, uh, remove you know eight to nine millimeters of the corneal epithelium, toss that epithelium, put a put put a bandage layer, put your whatever antibiotic and steroid drops, put a bandage lens over, and then treat it just like a PRK procedure afterwards, and so. Uh, afterwards, uh, good visual recovery. 
Uh, post office could be just like PRK, one day, one week, one month afterwards. If the patient had a recurrent corneal erosion, typically we will we will change, we'll put that contact lens on, we'll exchange it at about a month, and then we'll exchange it about a month. So we keep the patient with a bandage lens a couple months only for recurrent corneal erosions. Anything else, we take it off at about uh, at about one week. Any uh, any other cornea questions before we go to glaucoma? No, okay. I think we're all we're all caught up here. Okay. So any questions? Rolled in. Pardon? I said nothing else nothing is up. rolled in. Nope, you're good. Well, I know you two love glaucoma, so I had to put a glaucoma case. And I love dry eyes, so we're going to mix it all together. A uh, 58-year-old male presents for glaucoma follow-up, follow-up six months IOP check and, and OCT, using the COSOP twice a day. But I eyes are always red and dry, using artificial tears several times per day, uh, moderate. Hmm. Uh -oh. Looks like he's frozen. He's frozen on your end, Joe. Yeah, he was, but he's back. Sorry, oh, you, you, froze, you froze for about fifteen seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry, I made sure no my worries. kids were Fortnite. Oh, it looks like frozen, but he'll be back in a second, I'm sure. What's coming out? So cloudy secretions, uh, no telangiectasia. The reason why I have that, if it's telangiectasia, then I'm thinking if with dry eye that the patient needs something like IPL uh, for, for their treatment. One plus injection, two plus diffuse SPK, unstable tear film, so evaporative dry eye we need to consider. Early, uh, early cataracts, and you can see the rest here. And so... For my dry eye, you have a glaucoma practice, you have a dry eye practice. And so I'm when I bring the patient back, I'm doing the dry eye evaluation first, and then I'll check that pressure afterwards uh, for our patient. So here you can see glaucoma, MGD. And so we need to think what are our options for the patient and what are our options for the ocular surface disease? And why is that important? Because we know the consequences of dry eye and glaucoma we know these, these drops with the medicine, many of them have preservatives in it traditionally. And so chronic preservatives, detergent on the ocular surface that builds up the chronic signs of inflammation, the chronic signs of, of uh, punctate keratitis, as well as MGD. And we know the studies, Rita did a study, 96% of patients on a prostaglandin does have meibomian gland disease. But if they're putting the medications on their eye, if it stings, if it burns, patients aren't gonna do it. We know compliance is already an issue. Um, my partner, uh, Connie Okeke, did the adherence study where what she found is 44% of patients use their drops less than 70, or 75% or of the time. Claxton did a study, even with a once a day dosing of medication, you're only getting about 79% compliance. And so that's why if the patients are doing their drops, then that's where it gets the more advanced stages of glaucoma. And so we need to think back to the case. What are some of our options that we have? Preservative-free latanoprost. We have Tafluprost, Timla, COSOP. Consider doing SLT. We know that uh, there's 11 states that are doing, and soon to be 12, there's a governor that just signed a bill recently. So now there's more states that are doing uh, going to have the ability to do selective laser trabeculoplasty where we're taking the compliance adherence out of our patient's hand. And we know looking at the light study that this is a, a, is a, a, a very successful option for our patients, but then also minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. The more patients drops they have to take, going back to the Claxton study, once a day, 79% compliance, four times a day, you're only getting about 50% compliance. So if there are multiple medications, we need to how we can address that burden for our patients. And when it comes to MIGS procedures, traditionally we'd said you have to have a cataract, you have glaucoma, think MIGS, but that's typically going to be for any of the stents. There are other MIGS procedures that we can do on pseudophagic patients. 
Uh, dry eye options, the at-home therapies we can prescribe for that. Uh, we do know that we uh, the patient had a quick tear foam breakup time. And so we can prescribe something such as MIBO or perfluoral hexyl octane that lasts on the ocular surface for up to six hours after a drop, or consider doing IPL, microblepharo exfoliation, or some of the thermal pulsation procedures. But I do want to get to the SLT because this is something for my patients. Uh, we passed the bill here in Virginia about a year ago. We're still waiting for it to get finalized for us to be able to, to, to perform this within our practice. But whether I can do it or not, this is something I've been offering and recommending to my patients many for many years now because of the compliance adherence issue. Get better control of the IOP, get better control of the glaucoma. And so this is Katz's study. This is a, a, over a decade old where half the patients had SLT, 100 applications, 360 degrees, or, or a prostaglandin. And they want to look at the primary outcome of IOP as, a, as well as a secondary outcome of the number of treatment steps. And so they had a target that they set and wanted to see who had the better IOP reduction. And you could see 25.7% reduction with the SLT versus about 28% reduction in the prostaglandin group. But then also the number of treatment steps, only 11% of the SLT group required additional SLT. And that would have been an extra 180 degrees uh, for the second treatment if it needed a third treatment, it was the next 180 degrees, or for the prostaglandin group, 27% of eyes needed additional treatment, which was Timolol. So that's one, that's one study that came out. We do also have the light study, and looking at the primary outcome was a quality of life at three years, as well as the cost, cost effectiveness, clinical efficacy, and safety. And what they found is there was no difference in quality of life, but uh, or sorry, 97% probability of SLT as primary treatment being more cost-effective, but 78% of those patients were drop-free at three years. More recently, they came out with a six-year study, and what they found is almost 70% of patients were still drop-free at six years. And so this is something that, you know, I've been recommending for many of my patients over years. I mean, what are your thoughts? I mean, drops are great. I'm just a compliance guy. I try to do the least amount as possible uh, for our patients to get the job done. Joe, Greg? Greg, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, if I was in a state in Pennsylvania, I do have an Oklahoma license. I did get trained in their course and have an Oklahoma license. Um, so I think if I practice in Oklahoma, I'd probably be doing more SLTs. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, I don't have access, but I do have a surgeon that comes to uh, the practice. So yeah, I try, I discuss it now more with the patient. Um, I think, you know, majority of the patients, um, you know, will still opt for, you know, a drop. And then I say to them, you know, look, if it makes it toxic to your eye or, you know, it becomes too toxic, we're going to get some reaction. Um, maybe we can pull the trigger anytime it's a second med. Now, I think it's more, let's go SLT and hopefully maybe getting, um, them off of the medication, but my comment also would be, this was the first year attending the OGS that they really concentrated on the ocular surface and agreeing that, you know, these drops, uh, you know, are toxic to the, to the ocular surface. And like you said, Walt, if you have a glaucoma clinic, you have a, you have an ocular surface toxic reaction type of dry eye type of uh, patient or, you know, patient base. I, I I think I I, I kind of look at this a couple of ways. I think I think SLT is a viable first option, viable second option, viable option. I can I can say in what I've seen in clinical practice doesn't generally support or 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 match what we see in clinical studies. That mm -hmm. I don't see quite the same efficacy or uh, or durability. Uh, but with drops, we have to get over a bias that we all have. And the bias that we all have, optometrists and ophthalmologists, is from the very first day of our training, we're putting drops in people's eyes. And we think that people can do it. Patients can do it. I have learned to, uh, when I have a newly diagnosed glaucoma patient, I'm going to be putting on drops. I actually demonstrate with artificial tears a technique to do it. And sometimes when I, when I bring patients back, 
and I've not done that. I show them how to do it. I think that's actually, it's been helpful, but we have a bias that we think anybody can do it because it's so simple. We've been doing it our entire careers and it isn't simple for patients. They, you know, some have, uh, uh, they, they just won't, or, you know, they can't do it, but uh, a paper came out from the SIGIT study, which had a surgical arm and a medical arm. And they looked at the, they mined some data from the medical arm. And what they found was there is a, a population of patients who were getting uh, daily reminders, you know, from, from, from study court, daily reminders about drops. And these are people that had virtually 100% compli- adherence. And those patients had a rate of visual field loss commensurate with natural aging. So yeah. drops work. If they can be used. <laughs> so those are my thoughts that cover everything. You know, there's exciting. I can't remember the name, but there's a non-contact SLT coming out in the near future. It, it, do y'all, I, it's not coming to mind. Any updates that y'all have heard on that? I, I have not. Okay. Well, that'll yeah, be someone, the next. Someone just mentioned it in one of our lectures and one of our live meetings. And it was kind of like, quick get you know what's coming in the future but yeah pretty promising that's right i'll talk about it next time <laughs> so next case uh here going back to the ocular surface you know uh, a patient uh, reason for the visit 52 year old asian female follow-up dry eye check intermittent foreign body sensation fog vision over a year had lasik on restasis i meant to say cyclosporin <laughs> Uh, but looking at the medical histories, they're on aller- they have allergies, diabetes. And so medical history is always important. And you know, if they have autoimmune conditions, diabetes, thyroid, asking about dry eye, asking about their allergies, because we know site-specific specific therapy does help our patients. Looking at the slit lamp, vision's still doing pretty darn good here. Um, two plus injection on the conjunctiva, one plus diffuse SPK. Quick tear foam breakup time. I did Shermer's at that time. I know you both probably do it quite often too. Uh, but then anterior chamber, deep and quiet, and lens is clear. Uh, you know, there are lots of different dry eye uh, tests that we can do in the dry eye workup. Uh, easy way to identify the patients with dry eyes, give them a survey. And so this is what I use when I work with uh, Doug DeVries. And so here, this patient was telling me they have dry eye. They were telling me they have allergy. So I knew I should treat both for that patient. So one of the things we have to remember is we always look at the eye, but we always don't look at the eyelids. And so you're hearing, uh, you know, more, more and more times, look down, look for the lids, look for the lashes, look for, is there cholerates or telangiectasia? Does the patient have meibomian gland disease that express those glands? But one thing that we don't do as often is having those patients look down. And so we have this patient look down, you can see, most of that injection was on the superior conjunctiva. And so this is a patient with classic uh, superior limbic keratitis. Uh, the definition, chronic disease, uh, bilateral. I guess that's not really a definition, uh, but these are, these are the descriptions here. Uh, abnormal thyroid function. And so something we need to consider, we see that superior injection asking had they had a thyroid workup if they haven't, recommending and ordering those tests appropriately for those patients. The symptoms are worse than the signs. Um, pathogenesis, you know, whether it's due to dry eye, you know, one of the theories is due to excess uh, conjunctiva. So conjunctiva colasis, that chronic friction leading to the inflammation, leading to the symptoms that the patient may have. When it comes to the treatment for SLK, we have different treatments, whether uh, well, well, steroids, anti-inflammatories, or immunomodulators. We could consider soft lenses, autologous serum, uh, silver nitrate, doing chemical cautery. I've never seen that done working in a corneal practice, but it's something that can be used uh, uh, to, to, to address that. But a conjunctival resection, if you have that redundant conjunctiva, uh, anytime we see that conjunctival, um, you know, another example is conjunctival colasis, which I have in this next slide. And so here, anytime we see that redundant conjunctiva, uh, which is can be associated with SLK, is consider well, what are their symptoms? Many times these patients can localize that pain. I was lecturing with uh, Priya Gupta, who's a cornea specialist. She was at Duke. Now she's in private practice. She goes, well, just ask the patient. Tell me where the pain is. Oh, it's right here. We'll pull down your lid. If the pain goes away, 
then we can localize that. And, and likely it's due to the conjunctival chalasis. Uh, we can use the drops uh, or we, we can use our anti-inflammatories. We've heard that bromonidine may be a treatment for it, although the mechanism uh, we're not sure of, or I'm not sure of. Uh, but we can also do conjunctival cautery or hot cautery. And so this is my partner, Liz Yu, that is not doing it because the media is not working, uh, but numbing up the eye. And so for mild to moderate conjunctival chalasis is just doing hot cautery and tightening up that loose conjunctiva. If there was significant, actually, I don't, these videos aren't working. If there was moderate, severe conjunctival chalasis, then that would be done in the operating room where they're just going to dissect a larger area of the conjunctiva, use some gut sutures that will dissolve within a week, and then give the patient antibiotics for about a week. And that's often uh, one of the treatments that can be done for SLK or patient with conjunctival chalasis. Any questions or comments on that before I go to the next slide or the next case? I just got lots of cases. Rapid fire. I think there, I did, there's, there, were, there was a question or two. What is the success rate in your practice in general for coronal transplants, and what's the most common reason that transplants fail? Yeah, great question. What is the most common reasons? Why, wait, what was the first question? What's the success rate in your practice and in general for coronal transplants? And what is the most yeah. uh, common reason coronal transplants fail? Yeah, I guess we should probably consider peak, you know, penetrating keratoplasty as well as the uh, endothelial procedures because technically they, they all count. So what are your thoughts there? So, you know, I'm just picking a number right now, but I'm going to say within our practice, we got 90% 90, 90 success rate with those, uh, if not higher for our patients. Uh, you know, the biggest part is earlier within the, within the, the transplant itself, antibiotics for a week and a slow taper. We typically go with diflorepredinate, uh, which is four to five times stronger than, than uh, prednisolone. And so four times a day for a month, three times a day for a month, twice a day for a month, and then once a day for a month. And we do that indefinitely. Uh, as I mentioned, the six, uh, for the life of a transplant, let's say a PK is about 20 years. And so eventually that will decompensate. We will have to do it uh, repeated again, whether it's full thickness or a partial transplant. As for the complications, why for the rejection? Over time, sometimes they, I mean, they don't last. And so they do have a shelf life. The body does only, if we look at DSEC, I mean, the longest data that comes off the top of my head was, you know, life's six, six years, maybe longer. Uh, DMEC, D, DSO, those are still too new. And so I don't have any data off the top of my head, but that's the main reason why we're still monitoring those patients for both the cornea, looking at the pachymetry, but also looking at, the, uh, the the pressures and monitoring for glaucoma for our patients. Excellent. You all caught up? Okay. All right, spider bite. So here's a patient, 63-year-old white male, referred by PCP for sudden decrease in vision in the right eye, swelling in the eyelids, uh, uh, right eye worse than the left for a week, pressure from forehead, you can read this, worse in the evening, some tearing and redness. He said he was bitten three weeks ago on the top of the head while working in the yard, which became swollen that evening, went to the PCP and given an oral antibiotic, which he finished yesterday. And so, uh, and so pa patient came in and, and so he goes, oh yeah. He goes, yeah, I had the spider bite. Everything was all swollen. I had a rash and you can see the scab that's been there for about three weeks. And I go, did you all talk about shingles at all? He goes, no, <laughs> they just said I had an infection. I said, okay, well, let's just keep looking. Let's take a look at your eyes. Although we can see, how it respects that midline, it's, it's slow healing. So he has a non-healing scab on the right forehead, two plus injection, two plus SPK, microcystic edema. Any we anytime we see that edema, one of the things that's coming to mind is, you know, uh, and the redness is what is that pressure inside the eye? Looking at the posterior cornea, it had one plus KPs, no dendrites, two plus cells. You can see the cataract, but the pressure is 31 and 13. And so why is the pressure higher in one eye versus the other? And so that's a question coming up, polling question. Uh, common causes for increased IOP include all the following except A, angle closure, B, acute <laughs> nan granulomatous anterior uveitis, C, 
her, her herpes keratouveitis or D steroid responder? You know, I think what we all should do, Walt, I think at the Academy, I'll, I'll, I'll take on the uh, getting it COPE approved, but I think Joe, myself, you, and probably a whole bunch of speakers, we probably have the dreaded spider bite uh, chief complaint, and we probably could come up with a two hour, everyone's case being similar, but yet different in probably what has was the uh, true diagnosis. So <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, it's a very, very unfortunate arachnophobia. Spiders get uh, get a bad rap. <laughs> because it's never a spider. It's never a spider bite. I say that all the time at clinic. Definitely with five docs in our practice, we uh, monthly, the monthly spider bite every two months mm -hmm. or something. That yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it, you know, it, 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 that doesn't decrease in, in the dead of winter either, Greg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the, maybe that's like a peak. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's three feet of snow. I hey, get bit by a spider outside. Right. All right, I'm going to display the question. And well, um, I didn't close it yet. So people could still weigh in. I've got 9% uh, angle closure. We've got your acute non granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis at 45. That's the winner. Herpetic car uh, uveitis at 38, and steroid responder at 10. Yeah, okay. And so, yeah, so we have that patient with, with the Spider bites. And so anytime we have high IOP, here's the various reasons for the high IOP, whether it's angle closure, we're familiar with angle closure. Gosh, I never know what computer this video is going to work on. It's not this one. Uh, but angle closure, we're familiar with that. High IOP, you know, 40s, 50s, mid dilated pupil, steamy cornea, unilateral, that eh, can be bilateral, but not typically. Post operative uh, due to the retained viscoelastic. And so if this video was working, this is the left eye, right-handed surgeon paracentesis site. And so just put numbing drops in there and just taking your four steps and just pressing in, in, posterior to that lip or paracentesis site. Let's say that pressure was in the 40s. The patient has this boring pain. I'm going to drop that patient pressure down to about the single digits. And then afterwards, I'm going to wait another half hour because it's likely to go back up. If it goes back up quickly, I'm going to burp it again. But then giving that patient some type of uh, uh, glaucoma medication, aqueous suppressant, or, uh, or, or helping with the outflow as well. Um, the reason why you have to check that pressure again is Hildebrand did a study. Even after corneal decompression, after surgery, that pressure is going to go up with an hour. And so you, do, you may have to, to decompress that again. Uh, other high IOP, you can have high IOP in the non-seeing eye. Uh, uh, sometimes. And so, uh, you know, if you, you, you may have this, this patient that, you know, our, our whole goal, their patient the pressures in the forties or whatever it may be, we're just there for comfort. And so they may be on a steroid for comfort. Maybe we may have to do injections of, of whatever it may be just to keep that pain under control. But then the most common one is going to be first angle closure or herpes trabeculitis. So viral uveitis, Angle closure and post-operative uh, IOP are the most common reasons for a high IOP. So the diagnosis is, yeah, it was a spider bite. They had an infection, not shingles. Started three weeks prior, but I put this patient, I treated them for uh, for, for a zoster, a uh, thousand milligrams three times a day, put them on diflopredinate four times a day and Timolol once a day. And I asked uh, my uveitis partner, I said, hey, would you typically, pressure was 31, I can't remember the nerves. I think the nerves were still fine. I think they were fine. He goes, well, you could put them on a glaucoma agent if you want. You don't have to. That pressure is due to the trabeculitis. Once you get the inflammation under control, then that pressure is going to go down. And so you can if you want. You don't have to. But I typically do that uh, for the patient. We're all familiar with the Veratella uh, zoster virus, uh, typically chicken pox. We're not seeing that anymore because the kids are getting the vaccine. Uh, later in life, we're seeing uh, shingles uh, in patients, uh, and we're seeing it in many of our, our patients. And so, you know, one of the things as the primary eye care provider is talking to our patients and that letting them know, have you had the vaccines for shingles, which does decrease 
the risk of developing it as well as decrease the post-herpetic neuralgia that the patient may have. We're familiar with, with herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And yes, we all get the referral from the PCP saying they have shingles. Well, great. But we need to look at all the various structures because zoster can affect every uh, every aspect, or herpes in general, can affect every aspect of the eye. So yes, we're staining that cornea. Yes, we're looking for any type of uh, lesions on the, on the lids. Pseudodendrites, typically that's going to be elevated. It's going to be coalesced epithelium, but it's not going to be excavated. Those dendrites, pseudodendrites as well, patients are going to have the rash. They're going to have that pain going on the uveitis, the synechiae, they may have increased IOP, they could have inflammation in the back of the eye, macular edema, and so on and so forth. We're familiar with the signs and symptoms, but the main thing is we want to make sure that if likely the PCP put them on something, but if it was a spider bite, they may not have. And so that's where we come in and put the patient on, uh, on an antiviral. But post herpetic neuralgia can last for over 12 months in about 50% of patients. And, you know, we, we've, been, we've been taught, you know, start the antivirals within 36 hours or for it to be a, most effective. Yeah, I agree. But if it's outside of that, we're still going to treat it exactly the same. And so utilizing the antivirals, if they have inflammation, uh, a uveitis, such as this case, will put the patient on topical steroids as well. And if they get the post herpetic neurology, we'll co-manage with the PCP or a pain specialist as well. Uh, this is uh, the antivirals, more of a review, and this is taken from uh, Will's eye. Uh, herpes simplex on the, in the middle, herpes zoster on the right, double the dose for herpes zoster in those patients. But this is the, this is the big one here is the vaccine for herpes zoster. Uh, for adults over the age of 50, it's two doses, uh, two IM doses at baseline, and then two to six months later. But it reduces the risk of developing herpes zoster in patients 50 to 70, or 70 years of age by about 97% and 70 or older by about 85%. But then the efficacy against post herpetic neuralgia is about 85% for those patients. And so something that, uh, that uh, you know, I've been having those discussions with the patient, they cannot be active when they're getting these vaccines, but making sure that they're, they're talking with their, their PCP about that as well. Uh, any comments on how you all would treat that or how you address that? There's only a couple of minutes left. And of course, I always put too many slides in, so I'm not going to be able to finish anyway. No, I like it. In fact, I, in fact, I think you know, we're, we were, Craig and I were chuckling. Uh, yeah, the the moral of the story is, you know, the dreaded spider bite, it's never a spider. It's always, it's, it's always shingles. It's always herpes. So if you're out there in, in you know the audience, you hear somebody coming come and say they think they got bit by a spider. Yeah, they didn't. They got bit by herpes. Yeah, yeah. And so then I got some. To, I'm just going to say it might be a good place to to uh, do. I just do a very very quick wrap up here because we're really at about time. Yeah, and I'm just going to put my email up here. Uh, I guess this is for the next two hour lecture I have. Uh, I love the discussion. So I was ready to go. Greg warned me, but uh, uh, I love the discussion. And that's always the most important part. Uh, clinical pearls, all visual fluctuations. Most common reason for a visit to eye care providers is blurred vision. Tell me more. If it's always blurry, refractive error or cataracts or whatever. But if it changes or fluctuates, those are due to a poor tear film and we need to address uh, think horses, not zebras, although zebras do exist, and so do spider bites. Uh, but uh, continuous communication, you know, I talked a lot about surgery. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk as much about is collaboration and optometric uh, co-management. And so referring to each other, whether it's dry eye, whether it's glaucoma, whether it's retina, because we all can work together. We don't have to refer everything to, to ophthalmologists, uh, but everything we do, practice at the highest level of the profession and take the best care of our patients. And so there's my email. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Go ahead and uh, unshare your slides there for me, please. I will share mine. And uh, looks like all the questions have been, uh, have been mm -hmm. answered. And so uh, we're caught up on questions. So Walt, I wanna thank you for doing rapid fire referral grand rounds. This was a synchronous virtual course. It was very interactive. It was very synchronous. 
and uh, thanks for uh, presenting these these cases. I think uh, our our attendees will be better in clinic uh, tomorrow, and that's what uh, Joe and I strive for. Joe, any comments? No, I thought it was terrific. Here, it was indeed rapid fire. Uh, I I think you covered a lot of ground. Really, some uh, some very good clinical pearls. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys.